Okay, I can't see if you started, but uh, I'll, I'll just proceed. Uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, we will give this session is for information uh, only, and in case of any doubts, the uh, cool text that's online takes precedent. Okay, I will um, pass over to uh, our head of unit uh, now to overview the policy context. Thank you, Julia. So indeed, uh, welcome everybody and uh, already thank you a lot for joining us today and for your interest uh, into our uh, topics and call. I think the slides went a bit too far, but uh, okay. I can't uh, see what you see actually, unfortunately. Uh, it is one on similar calls from 2013, so you skipped it. That's too far. I'm That's not too sure far. why it's yes. not working. Um, I'll try again, otherwise I'll ask Dana if she can present it instead if it's not showing. Okay, um, so my purpose now was really just to give an introduction uh, on the uh, policy uh, context of this call that we have published. Uh, so I'm the head of unit for social and inclusive entrepreneurship. My name is Brigitte Philippe Bruno, and uh, so our unit is really responsible for promoting social economy in the EU across member states, um, as we believe that social economy has very strong potential uh, and is quite unevenly distributed uh, across member states. Um, and luckily, we are still stuck on the calls uh, timeline, but uh, and, and we cannot hear you, Julia. No. Um, so, um, this, um, so I was mentioning, so the overall policy framework for works is the support to a social economy and social enterprises. And uh, in that respect, we adopted uh, an action plan in 2021, which is uh, meant really to uh, support the, um, the whole ecosystem development. So, as you will hopefully see now in a second, <laughs> We have three building blocks in the action plan. Um, now it's full screen, but I'm on the uh, ch chapeau first slide. If we can move to the second slide, that would be, yeah, too fast. Just almost, yes, perfect. Thank you. That's great. We did it. Uh, okay, so um, uh, we have really three building blocks, I would say, in the social economy action plan that we adopted in the December 2021. Uh, and the idea is to enable framework conditions uh, to develop the whole uh, ecosystem. So what do we mean by that? Uh, it's about um, having in place the right policy and legal frameworks across member states. Uh, and the characteristic on which we come back to a social economy is that's really it's more a business model, so it really applies across all sectors of the economy. So potentially it has many, many implications and either uh, supporting factors or barriers. Typically some that come regularly are about state aids or uh, the role of public procurement, how they can help, uh, and also the business to business relations, how they can help or on their end hinder the development of social economy. And of course, it's something a discussion we must have at all level from legal local to uh, international, where we have seen recently a lot of momentum actually with recommendations being adopted by the United Nations, by ILO, so the International Labour Organization, and also um, by the OECD uh, closer to us uh, in the EU. So there's really a lot of movement coming, and beyond having the right framework conditions, we also want to open up opportunities. So that's really through direct uh, and uh, concrete uh, support measures that we want to develop for the actors in the ecosystem. Um, so it goes through, uh, as you can see, business support, capacity building, uh, and a very important uh, stepping stone is access to funding and financing, about which we will be discussing more obviously today. And then around these uh, actions, so the, the policy legal framework and the uh, concrete uh, support measures, there's a lot of work to be done still on recognition and awareness raising uh, because this, uh, the potential of this sector and its specificities and opportunities are not so well known. Uh, notably because we still lack data in many member states uh, to really understand how the sector works. Uh, so we want to develop uh, also that strand of work, developing data, developing communication and raising awareness. 
So, um, focusing more now on the uh, access to, to funding, uh, because that's what is more relevant for us today. And yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, we have developed a number of activities and tools uh, regarding the access to funding, which is usually quoted as one of the first and main obstacles to develop social enterprises uh, in the EU. And there I will focus a bit more indeed on within social economy, which is quite a horizontal and a diverse field on social enterprises. We have a number of act actions which are retargeted to social enterprises, and we will come back to the definitions in a minute. Uh, and all the access to finance is really focused on that um, type of uh, enterprises because it has been recognized that they are, they are facing specific uh, obstacles in access to finance. And uh, then, hence, it's really justified the, the fact that we set up uh, public uh, actions and public support. So there, I mean, with the slide, I mean, I won't go into all details. Just want to flag that you see that we have, we are trying to really put in place a complete ecosystem, uh, and uh, that goes from um, support to uh, from the really start uh, seed uh, projects. Uh, which uh, will go rather through uh, supports from grants side uh, to uh, a whole range of financial instruments, which actually are now financed under the InvestEU program. That's why in the call background you saw some references to InvestEU. And the idea is really to show you that we want to have in place some kind of a um, continuum of support uh, for microfinance and social enterprises. So from um, having subsidies to the seed stages to later on and going maybe through technical assistance for which we have the advisory hub under the InvestEU, which is now available to help with capacity building and uh, also with uh, really um, uh, advice for setting up uh, projects. Um, and then we go to the financial instruments and there we have guarantees, we have loans, we have support to capacity building, we have equity as well for short impact. So we really have a whole uh, wide uh, range of tools available. Our two main partners under InvestEU for uh, social enterprises are the European Investment Fund and the um, CEB, so the Council of Europe uh, Bank. So those are our main partners, and uh, so it's just to, to, to put our work in perspective, because now we will focus on the uh, CD yeah, stage, uh, and that's why we have launched this call. Uh, and the, one of the first actions that we had announced was to boost supply and demand of social finance market, and that's really now what this uh, new call is about. And now I will hand the floor to... To me, thank you. Julia. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. I also wanted to flag uh, that if you have any questions as we're going along, feel free to pop them into the chat. Um, if you'd prefer, you can also write to the Supply Demand Call Secretariat. The emails will be at the end of the presentation. Um, so I guess if we could move on to the next slide, yes. I will talk a little bit about uh, the, the rationale of why we do this, touching on what was just previously said. It's about addressing the funding gap for uh, social enterprises um, and addressing the barriers to access to finance. Um, we've run similar calls to this uh, since 2013. As you can see, they've shifted and changed quite a lot over time. Uh, so far, we funded uh, 55 projects and in around 25 countries. Um, and in 2019, it became clear that it made sense to put both the supply and demand aspects into the same consortium um, in, in order to improve project success. In the past, these were addressed through different strands. Um, under this call in 2019, the two strands um, addressed one addressing the very early stage market, so the tiny uh, baby projects, and the second strand uh, with the aim of producing a memorandum of understanding as the final deliverable, and the second strand was to produce a final instrument. Um, now, moving forward, we look to select indicatively eight to ten projects, but we only have one strand. So the thinking has changed, and this is based on the lessons learned um, from the previous calls. 
we found that the successful aspects were well the ones we were we intend to include now. So perhaps we can move to the next slide and I will explain um, what we will uh, in, be included in the currently open call uh, for 2023. So um, we will indeed still be keeping the supply and demand side in the same consortium. Um, and the initial uh, midway point will be the creation of a memorandum of understanding. So the agreement to work together uh, to create a financial instrument. Um, a draft template of this is available on the funding and tenders portal. It's not mandatory, but it's just so that you can have a look. And I would encourage anyone considering applying to take a look at this document. Um, and uh, another key factor is investment readiness and mutual learning. I'll speak more about mutual learning in a second. And the final outcome, if you like, of this call, uh, of the projects funded under this call, will be a financial instrument or a step-by-step -step for the very imminent launching of a financial instrument. So instead of having two strands under the previous call, it is now one strand that goes really from the beginning uh, creation all the way to the launching or the almost launching of a financial instrument. Um, and the budget reflects this and also the timing of the projects, uh, the indicative uh, optional uh, timing it, project should normally be uh, is extended as you'll see in the um, key information coming up. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so another key aspect of this uh, call is the innovative factor. Um, and we can mean innovation here in two different ways, as you have carefully picked up from the call text. It can either be innovative in the sense that it, it doesn't exist and it's new, um, or it can be innovative within the context, the market that it's addressing. So this might be a methodology that already exists, but is new to the market in that specific market. Um, so I think this is something um, partic to pay particular attention to. Um, I, uh, and the next slide, please. And another key aspect is mutual learning. This was a very successful element from the 2019 call that we would like to keep. There are two key aspects here. Uh, one is the five workshops that will be put in place by the European Commission, which will give the selected projects a chance to share best practices, um, because as we know, um, the uh, social finance markets across the eligible countries are d d differ greatly. Um, so they are very much at different stages of development. So there's a lot of opportunity for mutual learning, uh, which is uh, a huge European added value. Um, and the second part, which um, anyone, any careful reading of the text will have noticed that the eligibility is uh, very different from in 2019. Not only do, do the supply and demand sides come together, so the investor and the support organizations in the same consortium, but also they must, the consortium must be made up of two eligible countries. That means that um, a consortium made up of one eligible country, uh, well, is ineligible, it's not possible. So there must be two. That does not mean necessarily that the uh, financial instrument must be cross-border, it can be, but it's not a requirement. Only that two eligibility, uh, two eligible countries are included in the consortium. Uh, this way, uh, there is there's a nice example of options in the call text of how this could be. Um, I think uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the key information: um, the call is currently open, and uh, will be closing in uh, March uh, on this date. And here we outline the budget and the expected range of um, the project uh, grant or, and uh, the, um, the, sorry, project budgets and um, the uh, time range of the length of the projects. Okay, I think um, perhaps we can move on to the next part. Thank you, Jenna. OK, 
Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, okay, yeah. it's difficult to um, to see uh, uh, anything else but the big screen on the presentation. Um, so I, I'm uh, Tana Verbal and I'm jumping in now uh, because I, we thought it would be important to stress a little bit also uh, the fact that in this call for proposals we target in particular social enterprises. Uh, there is a definition of social enterprises that is included in the call text and it is quite important that you pay attention to this definition and that uh, in your applications you really target social enterprises and not something else. Uh, in fact, um, one of the uh, award criteria for, for relevance um, is uh, the extent to which the proposals matches the objectives and the themes and priorities of the call. And uh, social enterprises are indeed the theme of the call. Um, there is a definition in the call, as I said, it is uh, taken from the European Social Fund Plus Regulation. Um, this regulation uh, was approved by uh, member states, and this is also the, the funding program for, for this call for proposals. Um, the definition uh, it's a bit of a, uh, it contains some legal language, but it's actually not very complicated, um, and it's quite broad. Uh, there are three different uh, dimensions to social enterprises. Uh, first and um, most importantly, the, the social impact. Uh, they need to have a, a positive social impact uh, that needs to be measurable. So uh, ideally, uh, you will also monitor uh, the, the impact of these organizations. Um, and this can include also environmental impact, not just social. Uh, and this impact really has to be uh, at the core uh, of the business. This is the needs to be the main reason why uh, these uh, enterprises exist. Um, and another way to show that uh, the social impact is in their DNA is through the governance criteria. So the, um, uh, the re red wheel on the screen. Uh, in fact, they have to reinvest most of the profits into the organization. Um, that doesn't mean that they cannot uh, uh, redistribute a smaller percentage of their uh, profits to the shareholders. Um, and they are also required to have a participatory governance, uh, meaning that they have to uh, involve um, in the organizations those that are, uh, let's say, affected by, by their activities. So this could be workers or the community where the social enterprise is based. Um, and last but not least, the, the blue wheel. Uh, so they need to be enterprises, in fact, as the, the, uh, as the word says, they need to be entrepreneurial to do business, so sell uh, goods or services. Uh, this is also what um, differentiates uh, social enterprises from other, uh, some other organizations in the social economy, uh, because the broader social economy can also include associations that are not uh, entrepreneurial, for example. Uh, so, but I'm sure you will have no trouble with uh, complying with this criteria. Uh, so this is the definition uh, that is quite important and uh, I would also like to tell you, if I can move to the next slide, a bit more about the resources that are highlighted in the call text, uh, because uh, they can be quite useful for uh, preparing your applications, but also for uh, then um, using these uh, different uh, tools and, and uh, market analysis that are already available um, at the beginning of your project. And uh, here I would like to recall that um, in the call text, we um, draw the attention that applicants are expected to provide um, a detailed description of their target market in the application form. Uh, and this needs to include an outline of um, the current situation in the target market. Uh, the research that is already available and the, the areas that require further development. Um, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, based on, on this information from your application, we will be evaluating again 
uh, under the award criteria, uh, the extent to which uh, the proposal identifies uh, and actively uh, plans to address the needs um, identified in the finance market. So this is why it is quite important that you have a good uh, outline of, of the market in which you plan to uh, to operate and build the financial instrument. Um, so uh, there are some resources already available for uh, for this. Um, uh, on the basis of the previous rounds of the call for proposal, in particular the first and the second round of the call, uh, we have actually developed um, a practical guide that you can see on the right side of the screen. It is called the Recipe Book for Social Finance. Um, it uh, builds on the experience of these uh, two rounds of projects and uh, it's really a practical guide for um, investors and intermediaries that uh, plan to launch financial instruments for social enterprises. So uh, it takes uh, you through the step by step through the decision making process that is needed for, for launching such an instrument. So uh, it could be useful um, a source of information for, uh, for your applications. Um, and also very relevant, uh, we have included in the call uh, links to the summary of the projects that uh, we have financed uh, through the previous two calls in 2016 and 2019. Uh, and uh, you, um, as, as Julia has already um, explained before me, uh, these previous calls have, uh, uh, previous projects have also worked on uh, either gathering commitment uh, of partners or really setting up financial instruments. So they also had to do market analysis. So um, uh, if uh, if you operate in one of the markets where these projects also operated, you uh, will be able to see by looking at this project's results, um, their their websites, and and on their websites you can find already the, um, the market analysis that they have uh, carried out. So, um, for example, in 2019, uh, there were also projects from uh, less developed markets, like uh, we had uh, Lithuania, Estonia, Bulgaria, and uh, they have also developed um, um, uh, an analysis of the social finance market in their country. So this is already available. Uh, we kindly ask you not to reinvent the wheel and to use as much as possible the existing resources. Um, now, uh, moving to another potential source of information. Uh, this is a mapping uh, report of social enterprises and their ecosystems in Europe. Uh, it includes a European synthesis report and uh, 35 country reports. Uh, you have the links in the in the text of the call. Uh, the work has been carried out mostly in uh, 2018 and 2019. Uh, so they are a, a bit uh, outdated by now. Uh, however, there is still quite a lot of relevant information. Um, the reports look at the whole ecosystem, not just at the finance markets, but they also um, include information on, on policy and legal frameworks, on research, education. Uh, they also identify obstacles um, and opportunities uh, for further development. So there might be new developments for sure when it comes, for example, to the policy um, uh, frameworks. Uh, and also uh, when it comes to, to the quantitative assessment of the market, because this is also um, something that, uh, that the country reports have uh, tried to do, uh, which is to provide data on the number of social enterprises and uh, their size. Um, another um, other useful resources uh, can be found um, on um, the websites of the networks. Uh, that uh, we are supporting, so uh, networks active at European level um, uh, on uh, to support social enterprises. Uh, one of them is uh, the uh, Euclid network, and they have a European social enterprise monitor uh, that they have uh, launched in 2020. 
and that provides an, an annual uh, meta study that describes uh, the results of an online survey that they are uh, carrying out uh, and discovers both social enterprises and uh, startups. And in this context, they, uh, they have a European monitor, but they also develop um, information uh, at country level. Uh, what I am not 100% sure, uh, sure of is whether they cover all the countries. Uh, I think they don't, uh, but I invite you to, to use uh, the link and to discover whether uh, your country is also uh, covered by these studies. Uh, and another source of information uh, is the, the Impact Europe Network, formerly uh, known as European Venture Philanthropy Association. Uh, they have a knowledge uh, hub, uh, which includes research. Uh, the, there are a lot of reports, uh, case studies, uh, briefs, uh, and also training uh, offerings. Uh, then, um, uh, last year in June, we have also launched um, a European Social Economy Gateway. Uh, this is a website um, uh, which uh, aims to, to be or to become a one-stop shop uh, uh, for social economy entities and, and other social economy stakeholders. Uh, that provides uh, information on different uh, aspects that are relevant for uh, the social economy. This includes funding, training opportunities, uh, events and resources. Uh, there are also country pages, uh, so you can have a look at those pages. Um, they include uh, some uh, quantitative data, which again uh, might not be the most up to date. Uh, we are in fact working uh, at the Commission on, uh, on an updated study that will provide um, uh, information uh, on, on the size of the social economy, but this will all only be ready um, uh, in the mid this year, uh, so not on time for, for your applications. Uh, but there, there is also other useful information on these pages, for example, on the networks, on the intermediaries that are available in the country. So um, you could also consult these pages. And last uh, a resource that you could use um, is a better entrepreneurship policy tool. Uh, this is how it is called. It is, again, a website where we have, um, uh, we at the European Commission together with the OECD, uh, we have developed a, a policy tool. It is a self-assessment tool. Uh, that can be used um, by policymakers and uh, in collaboration with uh, social uh, enterprise uh, stakeholders uh, to improve their uh, social entrepreneurship policies. It actually has two, um, two sides. It covers also inclusive entrepreneurship, uh, but for social uh, entrepreneurship, it uses this ecosystem approach that you see in the picture. So. Uh, one part of the ecosystem is the finance part. Uh, I think you could especially use it uh, or find it useful for the start of your projects because uh, we request an outline um, description of the market uh, um, in your applications. Uh, but one of the first deliverables you will have to come up with is a, an in-depth assessment. And for that in-depth assessment, you could uh, consider using this tool uh, to gather the relevant st stakeholders in your market and to uh, perform this self-assessment uh, together uh, because the, the tool is meant uh, actually to foster uh, brainstorming and consultation. You can also uh, uh, do the self-assessment individually, but the added value will not be uh, as um, high as if you would be in a group uh, sharing uh, more knowledge uh, from, from different sources. Uh, so uh, these are all the, the resources we, we could think of, but surely there are more out there that we are probably not aware of. Uh, now I will give back the floor to my colleague Julia. Um, Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Great. Um, I had a few points to mention, uh, just things to consider when putting together applications. 
Uh, the memorandum of understanding template we've already covered. It's a more updated version than was originally released. So you may wish to uh, have a look at the latest version. Um, there are frequently asked questions on the funding and tenders portal. There are around 30 questions and these can be very useful. There are, as I will show at the end, um, there is a supply and demand call secretariat that can answer questions. However, here there are many that have already been answered and they can be of general interest. There is also a partner search feature on the um, funding and tenders portal. And I see that there are many already who have uh, been looking for a partner. And as I mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation, an important aspect is having uh, more than one eligible country within the consortium. So it can be the perfect place to find a partner to uh, submit an application. Um, I also wanted to flag a small corrigendum to the call text that was made uh, just to make sure that you have downloaded the latest version. Um, I also wanted to draw attention to uh, the requirement of a communication material that is to be produced within the project. So for those that are selected, um, a template of that will be made uh, for that will be made available to the selected projects. Um, general note uh, to make um, very careful, clear reading of the call text before submitting your application to pick up on all the nuances. Um, this presentation will be available online so you can rewatch in case there's something you missed. Um, I think that's everything. Um, you can check uh, things like the project uh, budgets uh, directly in the call text and the overall amount uh, available is also mentioned in the call text. Um, I think now I will pass the uh, floor to our colleague Avaro, who will give you a little overview of the uh, technical aspects uh, for the submission of applications. Hello, everyone. Um, trying to share my screen. Uh, tell me if you can see it. Can you see it? My screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, my name is Alvaro Fortun. I'm uh, uh, eGrants team leader in the unit G4D EMPL in finance and implementation and procurement. First, thank you, the colleagues, for this interesting, very interesting presentation uh, about the call. And I'm going to share some technical aspects and practical aspects. If now you're decided to make a submission of a proposal, I think this information could be could be uh, useful. I'm going to talk about three points. The first is the EU finding and tenant portal. Uh, second is the submission system and Third, uh, very important, the, the budget categories and cost eligibility, particularly for the unit cost aspects. Um, I believe that most of the participants in this session, they, they are familiar with the funding and tender portal, but in any case, I think it's very, I think it's useful to, to share basic information about the tender portal uh, if you want to, to, to make a, a submission of proposal. The tender portal, it's, uh, there are two sites. There is one with is public access, uh, and the other one is restricted when you are registered uh, in the portal. And um, if, when you are registered, you have the personal access to the user account, and then you have the personal access on the left to the IT tools. And the three aspects, three elements, that are uh, personalized services. There is the uh, there is a unique EU login account, the unique identifier for person. Then there is a peak number. I believe uh, most of the participants they have already a peak number, but if not, you need to to register uh, for the organization, uh, which makes the unique identifier for the organization. And then uh, yeah, the EU login account is linked to all the roles that the the user has to has in, in projects. The first this is one is the EU login that uh, you have to register 
and uh, to log in, uh, one email address for per person. And I can, sorry, I'm struggling here with this. I'm gonna show it. Yeah, sorry. So this is the easiest one, the AU login. The PIC uh, for the organization, you have to register organization requires an EU login account and every organization taking part in a proposal must have a PIC. Uh, re yeah, requiring the proposal submission system. So please make sure your organization is, is, is not registered already. Here you just need to to follow the steps of the of the registration and the, in in the tab of how to participate. Search if you have a peak already. Sometimes happens. If not, you have to go for the for the registration of the organization. Yeah. Then you have to to complete the six steps that you have to to receive your peak. Um, and uh, yeah, the moment of the registration, uh, uh, the 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 person who registered organization receive a, a self registrant role. Uh, but is the person contact person with the commission service for the organization until a leader is appointed? Where the leader is the legal entity appointed representative. The pick is provisional, uh, so meaning that there's submitted data then needs to be validated by the validation service. So it's only once the, 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 the organization is part of a successful uh, proposal later. And the roles. The roles, it's, um, we call it here the identity and access management. What uh, it gives a personalized, personalized and, ser and secures access to the different services of, of the tender portal. But the most important thing uh, our experience is the a lot of flexibility in the online management of the consortium. You will see it uh, now, and a lot of monitoring and tracking service. Um, here's a bit, uh, yeah, uh, to identify the the ro different roles that you have to appoint uh, in a proposal and in your organization, and. Um, yeah, as a, as a, as a, as an organization, you have to, you have to nominate the leader, the L sign and F sign without a legal signatory and financial signatory. And then in the project, you have to, you have to nominate also other roles, uh, in the, in the moment that you are preparing the, the, the proposal. Don't be worried here are all the, all the nomenclature, but, uh, yeah. The leader is very important, the legal signatory, financial signatory for organization, and then for, for the project, you need to nominate the legal signatory to the project, financial signatory for the project, and the primary coordinator on contact. But don't be worried because the minimum, the minimum uh, configuration that you need for a project uh, is to have a leader, a project coordinator contact, and uh, uh, a project legal signatory and a project financial signatory. And then you can nominate also more roles if needed. Um, and as I say, very, very easy to modify, uh, to manage the consortium, to change the, the roles in the, in the portal. You can go to the tabs, you go for manage, manage, my, manage consortium, and things can be changed uh, in the portal. That's very intuitive. You can edit roles and change depending depending your need. You can uh, revoke existing roles. I don't want to stay too long in this in this uh, slides. You're gonna have this presentation. You can go if you need it. You can modify organization. So it's very intuitive. And here, as Julia was mentioning uh, earlier, this is the partner search tool. And Julia was saying that many of you are already using this, this useful tool. And here is how it looks uh, like. You have all these uh, fields that you can, you can try to search by keyword, topic, call, program organization name country as you are searching for other countries or even a city and you're going to have um, yeah, depending the 
the filter you want to use the results here and so i think it's very uh, interesting and yeah it works very well and here when you click in one particular organization you can have um, uh, the general description the, the keywords so yeah that's um, and uh, yeah if you go to click for a project and you can contact directly from here this the 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 it gives you the primary coordinator coordinator contact and you can you can send directly you can contact them here are some links uh, yeah there's a recommendation to go to the eu funding and tenders online manual we are going to give you the the link to that and you have also here for help desk support services also you can you can go there you have some technical problems when you when you apply for a submission um second point is a submission system so your your you have registered already your 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 organization you have searched already the partners you have the consortium uh, when you have the consortium, of course, you have to define uh, if you have uh, if the organization participants that are in the in the consortium. You're going to define as partner, as uh, affiliated entity, uh, or associated partner. Then uh, you have the three categories. Uh, just to clarify that the the affiliated entity, we can say that the former link third party. Uh, so uh, it is through a permanent legal or capital link or as members of an association is the former link third party and the associated partner uh, is uh, yeah participating this kind of participating organization contributes to the project but cannot claim costs and the, then you have to define the the um, the category so here uh, I have I, I include the link of the proposal submission service user manual is very useful, very uh, clear in my opinion. Uh, so I recommend to go there to see uh, the specificities. And here, what I want to uh, share, I want to say, it's in our experience that our unit is um, responsible for the implementation of the project afterwards when the projects are awarded. We believe that um, a successful project starts from a very well structured proposal. So, therefore, I want to make uh, to stress the point that uh, I recommend to to make a deep reflection when you organize your proposal to 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 make a good structure uh, of the proposal. It is linked with the application form when you are going to to prepare your proposal. You're going to have to include the part A and part B, and the part A contains part A contains a structure and is 24, but it's almost automatic fill depending the the information you are included in the system. Uh, but the second one is more a narrative part and is a technical des description of the project. And here you have to describe the work packages. Um, what is kind of the the, the support of of the project, and in the project you have to define the milestones and the deliverables. And here we um, we have the experience sometimes that there is not enough clarity between what what a milestone is and what a deliverable is. So we really recommend to to make as I say that reflection. What are the objectives? uh what is the, the the control points that you want to to establish in the project um and then which are the outputs uh to to be submitted there is a difference here and and, and yeah sometimes we don't see clarity enough um uh, in the in the proposals one uh one extra information here is that the in the moment that you you're going to make the deliverables you have to uh, say if this deliverable is going to be public in case the project is a word deliverable is going to be public or not public which means sensitive this is also a reflection you have to do for for the project 
Um, yes. And then the third part, which is, I think, the one of the most important changes that has been uh, uh, done in the financial and the budgetary part is the budget categories and cost eligibility rules part. And most here are the, the, the categories of the cost that are eligible in this, uh, in this call, which is uh, typical ones, personal cost, subcontracting cost, purchase cost, and indirect costs. A, B, C, E, you are not seeing the D. Why not? Because it's the financial support to third parties, what is not allowed in this, uh, in this call. Okay, uh, but here the change goes in the purchase costs and particularly in the C1 travel and subsistence. And travel and subsistence C1s, as maybe you know, it includes travel, accommodation, and subsistence costs. But in the past it was actual cost, and now it's uh, not anymore. Is unit cost, and the first clarification is that it is uh, mandatory. The application of unit cost is not a matter of choosing one or other one. It's, uh, it's mandatory the use of unit cost. It's only some little exceptions that the unit costs are not covering, but really, really exceptions. And but 99% uh, uh, it's a unit cost. It is uh, 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 all the all the. Uh, rules are in the commission decision, uh, 49, 28, what it is an, uh, am amendment of the previous 1. And in this last 1, the travel cost has been inc increased uh, 25%. So it has been updated. Uh, yeah, because the, the inflation rates, uh, this 1 has been updated 25% more of travel cost not for accommodation and subsistence. And uh, other particularities that the subsistence costs are, uh, are based on the number of participants of an event, for example, uh, independently that uh, they are traveling or not. So you have to calculate the unit cost per, uh, per participant and then the beneficiary uh, uh, can keep that money for for the use of organizing a, a catering, for example. But then, the cost of the catering are not eligible. Otherwise, it will be a duplication of, of funding. So, that's uh, that's how it works uh, now. I think it's important to clarify at this moment the preparation of the budget, um, because we have seen uh, some some yeah not clarity in in budget uh, uh, prepare with actual cost, but then they have to turn in unit cost. It was not clear that it was preparing unit costs and so on. Now, I think here, I think uh, the information is clear everywhere and it's clear that budget has to be preparing unit cost. What is I recommend to go in the commission decision, there is uh, tables uh, that defending the distances and the, the the places, the countries where you organize the events, um, there are there are some uh, unit costs that you have to to apply, and so that will help you to prepare to better prepare your your budget more accurate with the activities that you are going to to propose in the in the proposal. And um, that's it from my side. It's I think the important points I want to share and I really uh, recommend to to check the the uh, the guidelines in the the, the 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 online manual and the submission manual as well and then thank you I give the floor to Julia again hello uh, thank you for that Okay, uh, um, I just wanted to share with you the uh, functional mailbox. 
Um, the um, first one here is for specific questions related to the call itself. And the second one is very much for more general technical questions related to application uh, submission. Uh, so they are quite different. Um, okay, so I could open up the floor to questions if there are any. I see that there are already some in the chat. Um, okay, we'll just have a look. Okay, does the potential investor applicant need to have slash provide specific experience in investing in social enterprises or in the social enterprise sector? Um, there is a list of annexes that are required. The experience of um, the consultants would be better to refer directly to those lists because it's very clearly outlined in the call uh, what experience is required for each member. Um, what kind of financial instruments could be financed? Uh, I don't think there is a limitation on this. Um, Dana, can you confirm? I don't think there is. Yeah, indeed, yeah. there is uh, no limitation. Um, you are free to propose also innovative instruments we have never heard of. So, uh, you can. Um, be creative uh, to, to address the needs on the market. Um, uh, I'm looking at the questions because we are just uh, reading them now. Um, first, um, I'm looking that there is one on the uh, on the ticket size, uh, so the ceiling for uh, the investments uh, that indeed is fixed as, at 500 euro, 500,000. Uh, um, and this is because the, the market assessments that we have available have shown that this is where uh, social enterprises face most difficulties in accessing finance or for the very small tickets, even um, even much smaller than this. Uh, this is where their needs are. Uh, when their needs are bigger, it also means that the social uh, enterprise has a bigger capacity to absorb funding and, and therefore it's already more uh, developed. Um, I don't know if Evita, you confirm this or you would like to complement you confirm. Thank you. Uh, I mean, maybe to add on this, if on, on the long term, uh, indeed, you could also envisage starting with a small investment, uh, but this is already going to be on uh, after the end of the project, because we, we are only asking you to deliver the financial instruments, not to actually start making the investments. But you could also consider having several rounds uh, of investments, but indeed starting with a ticket that is lower than 500k. Um, then there is a question that I will read out loud for myself to understand. So who are supposed to be the beneficiaries of the financial instrument that will be established? Um, okay. Um, uh, my instinct would be social enterprises, but it sounds a bit tricky. Maybe we have to give it a bit more thought. Um, I think we there are two ways to, uh, to understand maybe the question. Uh, who is the final beneficiary of this action, of this project that you're going to submit? Uh, so there, of course, the members of the consortium benefit from the grant that you're going to take from us. Or the final uh, 
um, recipients of the financial instrument that you will set up because of our action. So there are two ways. That's why it's a bit maybe confusing for us to understand. So I don't know who wrote the question and if you would like to clarify Hello. better, but the financial instrument that you're going to set up as a result of this action will, of course, reach and invest or give a loan to a social enterprise. Uh, but as a beneficiaries of the project, uh, these are the members of, of the consortium. I mean, I don't know if it could also, but for us to maybe brainstorm and then uh, reply to this question in writing as well in the frequently asked questions, because I guess you could also envisage that you plan to invest in an intermediary that is a social enterprise uh, and, and needs small financing. I don't know, a microfinance institution, but uh, that, that's very particular. I don't know if this is what you had in mind. Uh, please don't hesitate to come in and explain. <laughs> Um, in the meantime, we could look at um, uh, the question on activity reports. I'm not. Um, I'm not sure what the AE stands for. I would like to know if AE needs to provide activity reports. But the call mentions that um, the call text mentions that the mandatory annexes include. There's a number of things, and one of them is the activity reports of last year. So, hello, uh, just to clarify, I'm Jana. I post this question. It's on affiliated entities. If this only applies to partner or affiliated entities, because I didn't find a clarification on this. May I jump on this uh, to answer yes. is that if, if you are defining that the affiliated entity is responsible for the work package or for, for, for the report to do it mainly for the milestones of other people, then yes, it's uh, it's uh, yeah, they have to provide the activity report then. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the affiliated entity would be working mostly mm -hmm. on the financial instrument or on the capacity program, so it would be quite a major player in the consortium. So in that case, we should also provide yes. it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. And now that. Uh, I'm online. I, I may have another question, which is related to the last presentation, which was not quite clear to me. The le the layer, the legal and um, this legal person who will be charged in the communication. Do we need to um, define it right now at the application stage? Because I understood this will be only defined once we are eligible, once we are granted. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna be confirmed in the when in the moment that you are granted. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's just not uh, mandatory to do it uh, now. It's going to be validated afterwards, mm -hmm. but it's recommended to define it uh, in the moment of the proposal. Mm. Okay. Okay. So would we yeah. rather do it? So there will be the main contact and then also this legal appointment person, mm -hmm. but we don't need to provide this uh, documentation at this stage no. On, only. No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in the question related to could it also be a bigger center, a social enterprise, my understanding was that it needed to be less than 500,000 and that this couldn't be uh, negotiated. Does anyone have anything to add to this? No. Okay. Um, okay. I don't see any other questions uh, in the chat. Uh, are there any uh, final questions? If not, uh, as mentioned, these can all be any other questions can go to the supply and demand secretariat. Uh, we will also share these questions that you've sent into the chat and anything else we want to clarify uh, to the supply and demand call secretariat and they will publish the answers on the funding and tender portal. So I think this is the kind of ultimate resource really for all things questions.
Okay. If there's uh, nothing else, I think we can close the session. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Um, I hope everything was very clear. I encourage everybody to carefully read through the core text uh, in case of doubts. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very Thank much. You, Many thanks. Bye bye.